So this is the Ineos Grenadier, and in this video I'm going to be doing a quick look, not really a full review, of its off-road capabilities. I'm interested to see what it can and cannot do, some of the controls, etc. And I've brought along a Discovery and my own Ranger for comparison. Now this vehicle is actually a private vehicle, it's not a press vehicle. Normally I would phone up a manufacturer and, and get a press vehicle, but i have lucky to have a number of followers who help me in many different ways. I've got people like mechanical engineers, automotive engineers, I even had an email from a lawyer last night. It's not often you like getting an email from a lawyer, but this one was friendly and wanted to help. Anyway, um, so this follower said, look, um, I'm picking up a Grenadier. Actually, did someone else say that as well. Uh, do you want to drive it? And I said, yes, of course. So we've come out to the forest. We're going to see what it can do. <laughs> So what I'm going to cover is a look around the vehicle, an off-road comparison with a Ranger and a Discovery 2. We're going to conclude it with an analysis and summary, so you've got all the information in one place. You can use the chapters to jump around if you like, and there will be at least one more video to come looking at the vehicle as a touring four-wheel drive as opposed to pure off-road capability. Now what do I mean by off-road capability? That's basically to how well it traverses rough terrain, its recoverability, etc., robustness. What I'm not going to cover in this video is touring, towing, safety, on roads, cost and value. That will be for another time. And this was an early look only, only about half a day. The car needed some software updates, which I'm not going to cover because I think that's just a transient problem. And it was an Ineos Grenadier Trial Master, um, a diesel with optional modifications like the cross axle lockers. So let's recap what the off-road capabilities of the Grenadier actually are. It's all-wheel drive, permanent four-wheel drive, um, eight-speed automatic, petrol or diesel. Diesel is the one on test. It has low range, 2.5 um, reduction, and there are four positions exactly the same as the old Defenders, so high and low range, and you can lock the centre diff in either high range or low range or have it unlocked. It has brake traction control, as you'd expect from any modern car. There's hill descent control down to 25 kilometres an hour forwards, nine in reverse. There is an off-road map that off-road mode. Now this is unusual because it's not something like an adaptive terrain system. It actually does things um, such as deactivating seatbelt reminders etc etc. You've got to have the vehicle stop to enter it. Normally off-road modes recalibrate a bunch of electronics for the position. That is not what the off-road uh, mode does in this situation although it does deactivate or desensitize stability control which is not quite the same thing as what the other off-road modes do. So works a bit differently. Um, optional cross axle lockers, um, the test car did have them. Um, 265 70 17 tyres, a bit taller than normal. There's an 800 millimeter wading depth, which is pretty much class leading. Um, and it is a wading mode, and that does things like deactivate the engine fan, um, etc. So, tyres, the good news is it's a 17 inch rim, which is great. The bad news is the overall diameter. Now, the tyres are 265 70 R17, which is a little bit taller than the standard for this sort of vehicle which is 265 65 17 so it's a, um, the overall diameter on these is a nominal 31.6 inches but I am disappointed because I feel that for a class of vehicle which is oriented and off-roading should have been 32 and a half 33 inches I'm thinking of vehicles like the Ford Raptor uh, Ford Ranger Raptor which has um, taller diameter tires now the other thing I want to talk about is ground clearance uh, Grenadier or uh, specs state that it's 264 mil of ground clearance but it's not and I I think they've made the common mistake of confusing running clearance with ground clearance. If you come underneath here, I'll show you what I mean. So here's the steering um, dampener, and if I just push the measurement of truth there, you can see, well, you can kind of make up your own mind, but I'd say that's probably more like about 240 mil or thereabouts underneath the dampener. And if I go underneath the diff, um, it's a similar story, I'd say, oh, it's probably about there. Um, I'd say it's probably more like about 245 mil, may maybe 250 at, at top. So I think that they've got just a little bit confused with ground clearance and running clearance. The other thing is that um, I reckon that steering dampener is going to get absolutely um, belted because it is down low. I actually had a similar problem with my Defender um, and I fitted a bash plate not dissimilar to this but for some reason the bash plate just doesn't go deep enough and 
leaves this very much exposed to damage. Now, um, if we come down here, uh, this is the, I've moved the number plate out of the way. This is the winch free speed controller. And I like the fact it's really, it's really open, but it's, it's kind of a bit loose as, uh, no, actually that's, that's the way it should work. So yeah, it's quite positive, but I feel it's a little bit vulnerable, not, too vulnerable if you did, but I could see that getting knocked, so I'd want to see a different kind of design. Now here we've got the winch itself, and there's no space here for rollers, which is disappointing, but my biggest issue, because I do like to use rollers with synthetic um, uh, winch rope, and see my other video on why that's a good idea, but the biggest issue is how the hell do you get to the winch rope? I mean, you can't, you, it, 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 you can't get from the top, um, there's just, just no way to get to it from the top, you can just just about see it there. If we go underneath, it, you know, I'm not quite sure which bit to take off actually. So if you bird's nest your, your winch rope, you're, you're really going to have a, a, bad, a bad day of it. So that's um, disappointing. For contrast, here's my winch on my Ranger. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's certainly a lot more accessible and easy to get to than the Ineos. Now I was very pleased to see two loops at the front and two at the rear, which Ineos referred to as towing eyes, however they are rated high enough to be used as recovery points provided you use a bridle correctly as per my video which explains it. I found that you can't fit a four and three quarter ton shackle at the front one way but it will go the other way. A three and a half ton shackle will fit either way at the rear. Um, you can see that it fits pretty nicely. I would, however, um, be fairly comfortable using a soft shackle um, even if the bend radius is a fraction small. Now, one thing I will say, I'm loving the visibility. It is fantastic. Over the front, it, it's, it's straight back to when I owned my Defender TD5. Squared off bonnet, you can see exactly what's happening. Just um, so, so good to have that sense of control. And, you know, back in the day, it's like the Range Rover Command driving position. That's what you get with this. And the steering wheel feels great as well. The steering takes a fair bit of turning, pretty slow steering. I don't mind that too much in an off-roader. Um, we'll see what it's like on road later on. Oh, look at that. I can go up to third gear low range and I can still pull away. So let's try it out. Yes, that's good. And just as a reference, we're just gonna go back down to first gear low range. Yeah, okay, great. So you can pull away in second high and third low. This is good news. Nissan, are you paying attention? So first test for the Grenadier. Now I want to stress that in all cases we are driving to test the vehicle, which is not the same as the ideal driving technique to get over a given obstacle. Now in this case there's an extra test because the owner hasn't locked the centre differential and therefore the vehicle is struggling. I've left that in because it's important to understand you must lock the centre diff in these vehicles and it is a good thing it has a properly lockable centre diff. Now in this case the car is doing exactly the same again but the centre diff is locked and you can see that there is a significant difference. That brake traction control is a fraction slow to, um, to kick in um, but it does the job and it pulls the vehicle out of that cross rutted uh, section pretty nicely indeed. So now we've got the first of our test vehicles, a Discovery 2, no traction control so once it's out of flex that's a problem. It's also quite weighted towards the back. Yeah, spectacular. Um, no traction control there, so uh, try it with a bit more momentum and just see how much momentum you need to get past that. Uh, straighten up, left hand down, that's the way. And with a little bit more momentum, should be able to carry it through, but needs considerably more speed. That shows you the advantage of modern brake traction controller. Didn't allow him to use his lockers there, but he did have the centre diff locked. Now here's my Ranger, less flex, primitive form of brake traction control, it's only PX. I'm having to drive it quicker um, than the Grenadier because well, we just need to in order to get through that. Now here's the comparison of the two, you see my car's needing to go a little bit quicker. Grenadier is, can go slower due to better axle flex and also better brake traction control. You can see that you can just pause and bring it forwards quite nicely there. So now we've got the front and rear cross axle lockers engaged, centres always should be locked off road and you can see that there's no wheel spin and the car climbs up easily. So if you're thinking lockers are a good thing, they are, but they're not always as good as brake traction control. 
Uh, this is another view of the vehicle climbing that rutted little uh, incline and we have the centre diff locked as you always should but the cross axle lockers are not engaged and again wrong technique you shouldn't let the vehicle come to a, um, that sort of slow speed halt there but we're doing that to test it maximum flex a little bit bouncy but pulls itself out okay so I'm pretty happy with that performance and I'd rate it above average. And for comparison let's let the Discovery come up with its front and rear aftermarket cross axle lockers engaged. Right, so let's talk about differential lock. So centre differential's locked, the vehicle's in low range. Now I want to engage the cross axle locking differentials which are in the front and the rear axles. You do that with those two buttons up here. Now I've established you can't actually engage them in anything other than low range with the centre diff locked, which not a disaster but for flexibility I would like the ability to engage them in all transmission modes but you know that's the way it is now um, if I try and engage the oh, here we go the front one um, the car complains and I'll just grab the camera for a sec so you can see that it's flashing oh, let's try again um, front one and it goes it complains it doesn't tell me what what the matter is, um, what it should be telling me is that I have to engage the rear first and most other vehicles would say engage the rear first. So I'm going to press that and then you can now see it's flashing and what that means I've requested that the rear locker be engaged but it's not actually engaged yet. So we're going to put the car into drive um, and it's defaulted to gear 2 put away which is good and the rear locker is now engaged which is great. Let's see how quickly it comes out. So if I press that, it's flashing. And that means I've requested it to come out and it's still in. And that's annoying because I would have liked for it to come out quicker than that. It's still in, that's flashing. So yeah, I'm not wild on the fact that I've got to look up here um, as opposed to sort of there to see the status of the lockers. And the rear locker is still in. And I'm just turning a bit here on and off to throttle a bit. It really should have come out by now. Still in and it's still flashing. So when I go around this corner, um, one thing I like in a vehicle, if it's got lockers, in and out on demand, no messing around. And I'm feeling a bit of messing around. Oh, heck, finally, finally, the rear lockers come out now and it's complaining again. Oh, maybe that beeping noise is just to say the lock is out, who knows. All right, so let's say that we're going up a steep climb, bang, rear locker goes in, I've pressed the button. Actually, haven't quite. Okay, how quickly is it going to come in? It's in. So it comes in pretty quickly. Now let's see how quickly it will come out. Hold the button down and out. Come on, get out, get out, out. Still flashing. Yeah, it's taking a while to get rid of that rear locker. Yeah, this is, this is about the slowest car I've ever driven with locker disengagement. It just don't, doesn't want to let go of it. It's flashing, so it's off. Finally, okay, there it goes, it's out now. Okay, now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go for both at the same time. So you've got a really gnarly hill coming up. We're gonna go, all right, rear, front. Rear. Rear. Okay, okay rear flashing. Now let's go for the front front come on okay so we, okay there we go the front's in good so we got two in now and yeah obviously we've got massive understeer now but it's now let's see how quickly we can get rid of just the front one so that lights on so flashing out so I've disconnected the front one or commanded hasn't actually disconnected yeah okay the front lock is really slow I'm on and off the throttle, steering left and right. This is all the things you'd normally do just to persuade a locker to disengage, and it's still in. And, you know, it's metres back. This would... I would not want to be on a uh, really compressed, tight track trying to turn. And now I've got to go around this corner with... I oh, finally, the front locker's come out. OK. Now... Right, so for comparison in the Ranger, there's the locker switch. I'm just going to press that now. And you can see it's flashing. And straight away... 
pretty much the locker comes in, so that's about comparable with the um, Ineos, fairly straightforward. I'm going to press it off now, and you can see it's instantly off, there's no messing around. Okay, I'm going to drive up this rutted hill now, and I'm going to do it defaulted to second gear, which is good, and I'm just going to have the centre diff locked. Um, oh, that's okay, yeah, hill descent's fine. And we're just gonna, I'm just going to feel from the driver's seat what that traction control, brake traction control is like. I'm going to take a poor line and just see what happens. Those wheels are going to start to lose traction any minute now. And I'm just going to just let it come to about here. And just feel how that goes. There we go. All right. So we're now at the point where the vehicle's cross axled. Now, what I'm feeling for here is just a very gradual, smooth application of brake traction control, braking the diagonal wheel, front, left, rear, right, to send torque to the opposing wheels and allow me to move forward. So let's see how that goes. Just increase the rev slightly, not much happens. And yeah, that's... Okay, that's not as good as Toyota and Land Rover, but I'd say that that's good enough. Now here's another cross axle slight ascent and again we're just going to take the cars through slowly so you can compare them. Bit of clanking from the suspension, that's not overly unusual when a vehicle suspension gets uh, maxed out so don't worry about that too much. And we'll see how the other two vehicles get on. So again centre diff locked but uh, we have no cross axle lockers on this run. Slower than that. Okay, might need a bit more momentum. So Grenadier versus Ranger. This climbs a little bit easier than the previous one, but again the Grenadier does it better, for the same reasons it's axle flex and a superior traction control system so it can go that little bit slower and with a little bit more control. And you can see the wheel lift there of the Ranger for example of independent front suspension. A um, couple of things I want to test on the hill. So the first thing going to test is the ability of the park brake to hold. So I'll pull that on and then we're going to put that into neutral and gently take my foot off the brake and we're holding which is good. All right now we're going to see um, how good it is at doing a uh, hill start. So I don't know if it's got hill start assist, we're going to find out. My foot's on the brake, the car's in drive, I'm going to take my foot off the brake and okay it holds. How long is it going to hold for? Okay. It looks like it's going backwards and then it's trying to... Yeah, it is going backwards slightly. So it looks like it's got a hill hold assist feature. Um, so let's press my foot again on that. Go down and... Yeah, it's holding. And then, as with all of them, they don't last forever. And that's fine because I never recommend using them. Instead, what I recommend doing is this. Put your left foot on the brake, which I'm doing at the moment. And left foot braking does seem pretty easy on this car. Then we just bring the revs up. And you can see, I've got my left foot on the brake, revs up coming up to about 1500 there, which is plenty, plenty, plenty. And then I just ease off the brake and then up we go. So you can actually left foot brake um, on this car in low range. If it inhibits brake throttle overlap at higher speeds, I don't care. I just want it to work in low range. So. Okay, so this is the toughest test yet. It's uh, steep and there's a bit of mud there as well. Driving the Grenadier really slowly through, centre diff locked of course, but um, cross axle lockers not engaged and it's working hard uh, but it doesn't give up and it will still pull through which is good news. Now it's the turn of my car, um, I've not got my rear locker engaged, brake traction control only. I can't get it through this bit taking the, the hard line 
and uh, what I'm going to do now is just give up because I've got to worry about driveline damage engage the rear lock and you can see that that's pushing the car sideways a little bit so this is why you don't necessarily want to engage just the rear locker only and this is where it'd be good to be able to gauge say the front locker only if I was worried about traction on the rear or both so I put the rear locker in I'm just going to have to give it a little bit of send um, to get that car up there and even then it struggles so with the golfing capability tyres are similar to the Grenadiers as well doesn't really make a difference um, in this it's more about sending torque to the appropriate wheel now here's the Grenadier coming up um, with twin locks and you can see that this makes a huge difference it's much less effort than before so good to have that option when you need it but of course lockers massively restrict your ability to turn now here comes the discovery and what's going to happen to that yeah massive wheel lift which we awaited um, and it doesn't have his lockers in so a bit of wheel spin there and we're going to try it again um, this time we're going to put the lockers in and you can see what a difference that makes to the discovery but it's lifting a wheel more than the grenadier and again i think that's more to do with weight distribution at the rear now we've got the grenadier attempting to scale what used to be the hill of truth it's run out of clearance but it's pretty um actually pretty muddy there or earthy we're not going to really damage the vehicle so we're just going to give it a bit of a send and see how we got up see that 245 milligram clearance is going to work for us now what you want in these situations yeah, is gear and throttle control. You don't want to be coming up in first low. You want to be able to select third or fourth low maybe and uh, minimise the amount of torque going through the wheels and you want a nice responsive throttle and the Grenadier delivers all of that so it's able to do the job. Now I've talked a fair bit about brake traction control, here's an Everest demonstrating poor traction control. Look at the rear right wheel, it's just not getting the torque, it's nothing to do with tyres, the, the car can climb, you're just not getting the torque to the rear right wheel at all. Now if we contrast that with Toyota, who make one of the best traction control systems or brake traction control systems on the market, look at that right rear wheel, it's actually getting the torque needed and that's why the car can continue to climb up, it's not actually anything to do with the traction of the tyres per se. Put it into first low, we're going to go down this um, rutted descent and as you'll have seen from the video, the car's wheels will get cross axled and I'm just going to see how well the hill descent control system actually catches the vehicle so I'm going to do that um, pretty much without locked into first low without touching the brakes and this is where we're going to get that rear wheel lift let's see if it catches it or not yeah that's that caught it um, I can't argue with that that was quite well controlled um, and it's a very very silent hill descent control as well um, which I like in a way because I don't really like the rough launching noises but I actually like to sort of hear when it's working so you know it's working as opposed to just stuff happening with it without so um, I never thought I'd ask for a hill descent control system to be more noisy but um, here we are all right so we're going to go down the hill I'm going to put the car into first gear as you can see here lock it in and then we'll just see um, if it actually retains that gear or wants to move up or down so we're just going down here and see what the engine braking is like it's not the super steepest of hills but it's not too bad yeah I'd say the engine braking is pretty good and it's also keeping in first gear now now a bit about the winch the good news is it's a red winch's designed and built unit so red winch is one of the premier winch makers you can rely on them so that's a positive for me five and a half tons max pull more than adequate so that's again a positive factory integrated full warranty tick the box it's there um, that's definitely good as well crash tested also important um, there is a remote control you can easily carry a second one and just pair that quite easily you, if you're on a wired one you're going to have to modify the control box but that is possible um, and it only weighs 30 kilograms so it's a relatively lightweight winch as well downsides there's only 15 meters of rope of which only 12 meters is usable and that's 11 um, mil diameter that's not enough it's it's simply not enough because whilst i only run about 20 
only made is on my winches, the winch is actually capable of more. So when I'm doing a fleet angle, i.e. not pulling straight on, then I can get that on. Um, with that 15 meters of rope, you're gonna have to get it on very precisely. And remember there's limited access to it as well. So it's simply not uh, long enough rope once you're out in winching. You could make it work with extensions. Um, it's not impossible, but it's, it's definitely a drawback. Doesn't work in park, it really should. There's good engineering reasons why it shouldn't work in park, you know, stressing the, the parking pool, etc. But as a four-wheel driver, I want it to work in park. Same deal, I want it to work with the engine running. If you're stuck and the engine's not working, you need to do that last meter of winch, you're gonna kill your battery dragging the kayak because that's the decision you're gonna make. Or if you're just um, needing the engines off, you just need to pull the winch in out a bit to unsnile it, whatever else, you don't wanna have to start it. So I, I view that as a disadvantage. Again, not the end of the world, but ju just, just not ideal. And it is hard to get to the rope um, by default. You're gonna have to take something off. Ineos clarified for me that there is a panel you can remove. I didn't see it, maybe there is one there, but if you knee deep in mud and it's wet and it's raining, you don't want to be messing around taking a panel off to fix up a snarl or something like that. So um, that's definitely an advantage. But the biggest thing, it's not a standard low mount winch. Um, you can't just pull that off and put in one from TJM or uh, Warn or whoever else there. It's, it's literally a custom designed winch just for the Grenadier. So overall, I'd have liked to have seen a 9500 winch rather than the 12,000. Get a bit more rope on that drum because you can just use a snatch block for a double line pull um, and that would have been better. And by the way, yeah, trying to do a double line pull with only 12 meters of rope, you're really not gonna get that far. So there should be more rope on there. Off-road capability review then. So we start with the tyres, slightly taller than the average for most vehicles. 17-inch um, rims, which is great, um, nice high profile. Then we've got the clearances and angles, even at 245, 250 mil ground clearance, that is very good for a live axle vehicle, flat bottom diff. The rest of the angles and clearances are generally very good as well, and there's not a huge amount of things to get hung up on, so I like that. The gear and the engine flexibility control, really important for off-roading. You can meter out just as much power and torque as you need. If you select a gear, it stays in the gear. You can pull away in higher gears. You, you um, can't really fault any of that. The brake traction control is very good. Maybe it's not absolutely class leading, but it's more than good enough, and I'd say it's above average. It has a low and high range center diff lock. I really appreciate that. Those four positions there, including low range center diff unlocked. Um, the center differential actually locks, which I think is important. In theory, a vehicle with a electronically controlled centre coupling should outperform a pure centre diff lock, but in my experience that hasn't been the case. Um, I prefer the fact it locks. You can, you've got security when you're on a hill, um, for example, parking the thing, and if you snap a CV or something similar, you can isolate that and then uh, drive the other um, set of wheels. So I think that's important. And it's got a proper park brake. You're not relying on a servo on a hill. You just pull the lever up and then you're in. It's got cross axle lockers, which are optional, but still it's got them, which is great. The seating visibility steering, it's all very good. I love that squared off bonnet. Look, you can see what's going on there. I think, I think that's um, all excellent. And the steering is good um, off-road. We'll cover on-roads another time. It's got recovery points, two of them, which is good and front and rear, and they're fairly easy to get to, notwithstanding that four and three times shackle. So I think that's great as well. There's a lot of good information on screens. I didn't go into that in video. Will in another one. It's mostly useful. Um, and it's 800 mil wading depth, which is great. And it's got a wading mode and that raises air intake. Ineos didn't confirm whether it was sealed or not. If it isn't, it could be sealed aftermarket, so not the end of the world. Okay, on the improvement front, the tyres could be a little bit taller. Um, you can obviously fix that aftermarket. Uh, the steering arm's a little bit vulnerable. Again, you can fix that with a proper bash plate. Um, the great winch, um, but poor implementation, I've covered that uh, before. Slow locker disengagement. Now, Ineos came back to me on this and they said, actually, it is disengaging quickly, but because they rely on a difference between left and right wheel speed to turn this, the light off, that's why the light only went off when I went round a corner. Um, I guess that's okay, it's certainly not the end of the world, but it's just, if Ford and others can do a better job of it, why can't um, Ineos? Um, no hill descent control, brake traction control with lockers, that's a, again, not the end of the world, but um, when you're going downhill, you do want to have your lockers engaged. If, it, if it's rutted, that will definitely help retard things, um, and to have hill descent control as well as a bonus. And you also want to engage the rear locker and have brake traction control work on the front axle, not the case in the Ineos, and I think that's a disadvantage, but again, not the end of the world. 
world. Um, Locker's only in low range. Another one, yeah, I'd have liked to have seen in high range. You can certainly, it's, it's not a ma massive problem, but just a thing I'd like to see. Probably the, the major one though is usability. They seem to use the same chime for everything. It's not clear whether the car's coming in out of low range or it's, it's, um, it's uh, the lockers are coming in or the lockers are coming out, etc. You've got to look up in the roof to, to see, um, to press buttons, which isn't ideal. I think a lot of this stuff you're going to get used to with time as you operate a vehicle, but um, I do think that usability uh, could be overall improved. But none of these negatives are, are, are absolute deal breakers and the car is very capable. So that's kind of my summary. This is a very, very capable uh, vehicle off-road. I'd put it definitely towards the top end of the market. Um, compared to a 70 series, the 70 series wouldn't see which way the Grenadier went off-road. Um, it wouldn't quite keep up with a Wrangler Rubicon, but then again, not much else does. It's kind of a different class of vehicle um, and it's certainly better than the g-class as well so rest assured this vehicle has the goods off-road there's no question about that um, but it is a very different vehicle to japanese four-wheel drives let's be clear about that so if you're jumping from to the others um, you're going to need some, maybe some training fleet managers i think are going to take note of that and um, finally um, what do you want to see in the next video what didn't i cover any questions you've got this has been a fairly um, quick production um, let me know and I hope you found this video useful. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the comments and thank you for watching.